temporal lobe of the cerebrum can cause partial or complete loss of vision. Changes in speech, hearing, memory, or emotional states such as aggressiveness and sadness and problems understanding or retrieving words can develop from a tumor in the frontal and temporal lobe of the cerebrum. Altered perception of touch or pressure, arm or leg weakness on one side of the body or confusion with left and right sides of the body are linked to a tumor in the frontal or parietal lobe of the cerebrum. Inability to look upward can be caused by pineal gland tumor and lactation, which is a secretion of breast milk, and altered menstrual periods in women and growth in hands and feet in adults are usually linked with a pituitary tumor. Difficulty swallowing, facial weakness or numbness, or double vision is a symptom of a tumor in the brainstem. Vision changes, including loss of part of the vision or double vision, can be from a tumor in the temporal lobe, occipital lobe, or brainstem. Another more important common symptom and one that plays a poor role in diagnosis is, are seizures. And people may experience different types of seizures. Certain drugs can also help prevent or control them. Motor seizures, also called convulsions, are sudden voluntary movement of a person's muscle. The different types of seizure and what they look like are listed below. Myoclonic. Myoclonic seizures uh, involve single or multiple muscle twitches, jerks, or spasms. The second form of seizure is the tonic, clonic, or grand mal seizure. This involves a loss of consciousness excuse me, and body tone, followed by twitching and relaxing muscles, and these are called contractions. Uh, loss of body control functions, such as uh, the loss of bladder control, is also common with tonic clonic seizures. And in tonic clonic seizures, there may also be a short 30 second period of no breathing, and a person's skin may turn a shade of blue, purple, gray, white, or green. After this type of seizure, a person may be sleepy and experience a headache, confusion, weakness, numbness, and sore muscles. Uh, the third type of seizure is a sensory seizure. And these kind of seizures involve a change in sensation, vision, smell, and or hearing without losing consciousness. Uh, the fourth type of seizure is a complex partial seizure, and this may cause a loss of awareness or a partial or total loss of consciousness. And it may be associated with repetitive, unintentional movements such as twitching. So these are a couple of common symptoms and why... Uh, they are important for diagnosis. So with that, moving on to diagnosis, the diagnosis of brain tumor usually consists of three steps, a neurological exam, a brain scan, and a biopsy. The neuro exam consists of a mental status part of the exam, a motor function and balance part of the exam, and a sensory exam. During the mental status part of the exam, the patient's level of awareness and interaction with the environment may be assessed by conversing with the patient and establishing his or her awareness by asking a series of questions involving his or her environment and maybe asking personal questions as well. During the motor function balance part of the test, the doctor performs this by having the patient push and pull against his or her hands with the patient's arms and legs. The sensory part of the exam involves a patient's doctor uh, doing a sensory test that checks his or her ability to feel. This may be done by using different instruments, including bell needles, tuning forks, alcohol swabs, or other objects. Moving on to the brain scan. Uh, the MRI is the main uh, type of scan done when it comes to brain tumor diagnosis. PET scans and CT scans are also scans. Uh, intravenous gadolinium enhanced MRI is typically used to help create a clear picture of a brain tumor. This is when a patient first has a regular MRI and afterwards is given a special type of contrast medium called gadolinium through an IV. Then a second MRI is done to get another series of pictures using the dye. An MRI technique called perfusion imaging shows how much blood is reaching the tumor. This method helps doctors predict how well treatment will work. Moving on, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. MRS is a test using an MRI that provides information on the chemical composition of the brain. It can help tell the difference between any dead tissue caused by previous radiation treatments and new tumor cells in the brain. The third, excuse me, the third part of 
diagnosis is the biopsy. And this is a very important part of the diagnosis as the procedure can be very valuable to people who are immunocompromised and who have evidence of brain lesions that can be caused by opportunistic infections, not only uh, brain tumors. In other groups, particularly those with unexplained neurological disease, a bi diagnosis is reached by performing a biopsy in half the cases where it's done and has helpful practical effect in about 30%. And so I'll be discussing a little bit about the technique of the biopsy. So once a patient is asleep, the head is secured and the big jewels on the scalp are registered by cameras into the computerized navigation system. And historically, the patient's head was held in a rigid frame to direct the probe into the brain. However, since the early 1990s, it has now been possible to perform these biopsies without the frame. Uh, since the frame was attached to the skull of screws, the new method of stabilization is less invasive and much better tolerated by Moving on with the technique, a minimal amount of hair is shaved from the incision area and a small incision is marked out. The area is meticulously cleaned and draped in a sterile fashion. And then an opening in the skull about the size of a quarter is made, this is called the burr hole. And the covering of the brain, the dura, is open. A stereostatic biopsy needle, which is long and has a soft nosed blunt tip, is reintroduced to the target using the neural navigation system in order to guide it. Biopsy samples are obtained. These samples are then examined in real time by performing frozen section analysis with a pathologist. Then additional samples are obtained for permanent pathology studies. The final results take three to four days to allow for special stains to be completed which enhance the accuracy of the diagnosis. However, indications, as mentioned before, are not only uh, the common ailments that uh, can be diagnosed by a biopsy are not only tumors, but can include inflammation, demyelinating diseases, and even a neurodegenerative disease such as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there are some risks involved with biopsy, but for the most part, it is rather safe. Some of the risks include uh, intracranial hemorrhage, which happens approximately 1% of the time, infection, which again happens only about 1% of the time, or the inability to obtain tissue to make the diagnosis, which again happens one of the first time. If that does occur, then a repeat biopsy is required. For the most part, as mentioned, it's a safe and useful procedure and it's conducted by neurosurgeons with exquisite planning and care and can provide valuable information guiding further treatment. Uh, moving on. Now to the grades of brain tumors. So to determine the growth and development of tumors in the brain, doctors focus on the characteristics Tumor and its effect on functionality. The main factors used to assess brain tumor include size and location, type of tissue or cells affected, susceptibility, the likelihood that part or all of the tumor can be removed by surgery, the spread of the cancer within the brain or spinal cord, and the possibility the cancer has spread beyond the brain or thickness. A complete assessment will also factor in age and brain cancer symptoms that are limiting basic functions such as speech, hearing, or movement. Brain cancer grading is much different than staging other cancers in the body. Cancers in the lung, colon, and breast are staged based on their location in the body, size, lymph node involvement, and possible spread. Tumors in the brain are graded based on how aggressive the tumor cell appears under a microscope. The grade and receptibility of the tumor will help guide treatment decisions. Uh, surgery depends on the tumor's accessibility, size, extent, and the patient's overall health. And so now moving on to the actual grades. So grade one tumors is where the tumor grows slowly and rarely spreads into nearby tissues. It may be possible to completely remove the tumor with surgery. Grade two tumors, the tumor grows slowly but may spread into nearby tissues or recur. Moving on, grade three tumors is where the tumor grows quickly. It's likely to spread into nearby tissues and the tumor cells look very different from normal cells. Grade four tumors, the word spine, the tumor grows and spreads very quickly and the tumor cells do not look like normal cells whatsoever. Now to touch a little bit upon brain metastasis. Secondary brain tumors, which have spread to the brain from another location in the body are much more common than primary brain tumors. These tumors are also becoming increasingly more common as individuals do better with cancer treatment and live longer. 
giving the original cancer the opportunity to spread through the brain. Some cancers that commonly spread through the brain are lung, breast, colon, kidney, melanoma, thyroid, and uterine cancers. Lung cancer is the most common form of the brain metastasis. And in fact, lung cancer staging often involves a brain. Brain metastases will likely be assessed through the tumor, node, metastasis staging system, EM, and sometimes individuals are diagnosed with brain or spinal metastases before they realize they have another primary form. So moving on to biomarkers of brain tumors, and they're pretty important because recent studies of malignancies of the CNS have revolutionized our understanding of the biology of brain tumors. This newly gained knowledge provides a great opportunity for biomarker-driven clinical research. Biomarkers have so, owed so much promise as a diagnostic and prognostic tool that the most recent updated World Health Organization classification of brain tumors from 2016, for the first time, included molecular markers to determine subclasses of gliomas and medulloblastomas. Gliomas are the most common primary brain tumors in adults. Anaplastic astrocytoma and glioblastoma multiform represent malignant astrocytomas, which are the most common type of malignant gliomas. Despite research efforts in cancer therapy, the prognosis of patients with malignant gliomas remains poor. Research efforts in recent years have focused on investigating cellular, molecular, and genetic pathways involved in the progression of malignant gliomas. As a, as a result, biomarkers have emerged as a diagnostic, predictive, and prognostic tool that have the potential to transform the field of brain tumor diagnostics. An increased understanding of the important molecular pathways that have been in the progression of malignant gliomas has led to the identification of potential diagnostic, prognostic, and predictive biomarkers, some bearing clinical implications for target therapy. Now I'm just gonna go through a common, uh, some commonly used biomarkers so MGMT, 1P, slash 19Q, TERT, AKT3, and ATRX. I'm going to start out with MGMT. MGMT is a protein that repairs errors in DNA. When the gene encoding MGMT is silenced by methyl methylation, chemotherapy may be more effective because cancer cells cannot repair cellular damage. Testing for the MGMT gene promoter has been used to identify whether or not the patient could benefit from the chemotherapy. 1P slash 19Q test, so moving on to 1P, 1Q. 1P slash 19Q test looks at genetic changes to uh, chromosome numbers 1 and 19 in tumor cells, whether these chromosomes are complete or have a section missing. If sections of 1P slash 19Q are found missing, researchers show that this could mean better outcomes for people with some types of brain tumors. Moving on to TERP. TERP is a gene that encodes telomerase, an enzyme that produces protective caps at the ends of chromosomes that are called telomeres. And telomeres shorten as, a, as cells age and eventually cause cell death. The mutation turns on the TERP gene, a mutation turns on the TERP gene, enabling cancer cells to keep their telomeres long. By maintaining long telomeres, glioma cells can divide indefinitely without aging and dying. Their mutations are found in 80% of glioblastomas and oligodendrogliomas and 25% of grade 2 and 3 astrocytomas. Moving on to AKT3 protein. And the AKT3 protein is a highly active in glioblastoma and which interacts with additional glioma relevant genes. AKT3 presence may indicate the resistance to standard treatment and it is found in glioblastoma tumors. Finally, to the last biomarker I'll be talking about today, the ATRX biomarker. And the ATRX biomarker is a gene that alters DNA confirmation in order to regulate which genes are expressed and which are silenced. It's also important for maintaining DNA integrity. Mutations in ATRX are observed in up to 80% of grade two and three astrocytomas, where they commonly co-occur with IDH mutation are associated with extremely long telomeres. ATRX mutations may have prognostic importance, but whether this is independent of the effects of IDH mutation remains unclear. ATRX gene is found in grade two and three astrocytomas and secondary glioblastoma. And now we'll be moving on to therapies and treatments. And so treatments depend, as mentioned before, on size and type and grade of the tumor. If the tumor is putting pressure on different parts of the brain, 
if the tumor is spread, uh, and possible side effects of the treatment and therapies are also a factor. And also patient preference, with patients uh, preferring uh, the least invasive uh, therapy and treatment and also the one with the best health. Of course. And so a couple, the, the most common therapies and treatments for uh, brain tumors are surgery, radiation therapy, uh, therapy involving drugs and experimental chemotherapy, and lead laser interstitial thermal therapy. I'll be talking a little bit first about uh, the first three uh, therapies and treatments, and then moving on for the rest of the presentation to laser interstitial thermal therapy. So for surgery, surgery is usually the treatment for most brain tumors. And in order to remove a brain tumor, a neurosurgeon makes an opening in the skull, and this operation is called a craniotomy. Whenever possible, the surgeon attempts to remove the entire tumor. And if the tumor cannot be completely removed without damaging vital brain tissue, the doctor may remove as much of the tissue as possible. This partial removal helps to relieve symptoms by reducing pressure on the brain and reduces the amount of tumor to be treated by radiation therapy or some tumors cannot be removed, and so that, if that is the case, then the doctor will only perform a biopsy and use a biopsy to help decide which treatment to use down the road. Other advanced techniques during surgery include brain mapping to find functional pathways near tumors, endoscopy to perform biopsies and open spinal fluid pathways through a small scope, and advanced frameless stereotactic computer-assisted tumor sections. And intraoperative MRI also is available to help maximize tumor removal. Radiation therapy. Radiation therapy, also called radiotherapy, is the use of high powered rays to damage cancer cells and stop them from growing. It's often used to destroy tumor tissue that cannot be removed with surgery or kill cancer cells that may remain after surgery. Radiation therapy also is used when surgery is not possible. Radiation therapy can be given in two ways, the first being external radiation. External radiation comes in the form of a large machine. And generally, external radiation treatments are given five days a week for several weeks. The treatment schedule depends on the type and size of the tumor and the patient's age. Given the total dose of radiation over an extended period of time, to protect healthy tissue in the area of the tumor. Thermal radiation may be directed just to the tumor, the surrounding tissue, or to the entire brain. Sometimes the radiation is also directed to the spinal cord. And when the brain, whole brain is treated, the patient often receives an extra dose of radiation to the area of the tumor. This can come either in the form of external radiation or in the second form of external radiation from an implant. The radiation that comes from uh, radioactive material directly placed in the tumor is called implant radiation therapy. Depending on the material used, the implant may be left in the brain for a short time or permanently. Implants lose a little radioactivity each day, and the patient stays in the hospital for several days while the radiation is most active. Moving on with radiation therapy, we have the gamma knife or stereotactic radiosurgery, which is another way to treat brain tumors. The gamma knife isn't actually a knife but a, a radiation therapy technique that delivers single, finely focused, high dose of radiation frequency to this target. Treatment is given in just one session, and high energy rays are aimed at the tumor from many angles. In this way, a high dose of radiation reaches a tumor without damaging other brain tissue. Now, to the third form before we get to lid, is chemotherapy. And chemotherapy is the use of drugs to kill cancer cells. The doctor may use just one drug or a combination, usually giving the drugs orally or by injection into a blood vessel or muscle. Intrathecal chemotherapy involves injecting the dr drugs into the cerebral spinal fluid. Chemotherapy is usually given in cycles. A treatment period is followed by a recovery period, then another treatment period, and so on and so forth. Patients often don't need to stay in the hospital for treatment, and most drugs can be given in the doctor's office or clinic. However, depending on the drugs used, the way they are given, and the patient's general health, a short hospital stay may be necessary. Advances in chemotherapy include direct placement into the tumor cavity using a new technique called convection-enhanced delivery. And now, to the subject everyone's been waiting for, LIT. And so what is LIT? LIT is the selective destruction of tumor cells by heat 
And how is this heat applied? Well, this heat is applied by a laser that's guided by optical fibers. And the tissue penetration varies from two millimeters to 10 millimeters. And the laser heat from the tumor tissue, which can either lead to the tissue becoming more susceptible to chemotherapy or to the complete tumor necrosis. Damage is calculated using the Arrhenius thermal dose model, which I'll get more in, uh, which I'll get into more depth later on. So a little bit about the history of it. So the application of lasers in the brain started in 1965 when a pulsed ruby laser was used on the cranium of mice and guinea pigs, leading to immediate death. The cause of death was increased in the cranial pressure, and this was because of the explosive interaction of the laser and brain tissue. Later, the pulse ruby laser was used on brains of cats, and this led to hemorrhagic lesions at the site of impact. These early reports aimed to study the destructive effect of laser on tissue before human clinical trials. First use of a laser in a human was in 1966, when again, a pulse ruby laser was selectively focused on a brain tumor, leading to incomplete tumor necrosis. There was a poor absorption of the laser by the pigmented tissues, which made it difficult to control the thermal effect on neural tissue, and is what led to the tumor necrosis. This early report showed that the procedure was feasible, but that more research was needed to have controlled and selective lesion targeting. Without controlled and selective targeting, adequate lesion ablation would not be possible. In 1966, a CO2 laser, which is a high-power, continuous-wave laser, was used to neutralize a recurrent glioma. And although the procedure was precise and controlled, it was very time-consuming and therefore impractical. Between 1976 and 1979, more than 250 central nervous system lesion ablations were performed by Ashner and Hepner after they modified a CO2 laser. They modified by adding a visible helium laser to guide the surgeon to precisely direct the invisible CO2 laser. In addition, they coupled the laser to an operating microscope to increase precision. The result was a powerful microsurgical scalpel used for extra axial tumors and small intraaxial vascular lesions. A neodymium doped vitrium aluminum garnet or and the YAG laser, if you don't want to say all that, was also used, but lacked the precision required for most neurosurgical procedures on or as tissue, and this led to extensive collateral damage. Because the ND YAG laser is selectively absorbed by blood and blood vessels, it can be used to include small blood vessels. In addition, studies on rabbit brain show that the ND YAG laser penetrated deeper than the CO2 laser the depth of penetration was predictable, and its effect on vascularized tissue was greater than that of the CO2 laser. Now, we're getting closer to modern day lit. 1983, Bound used the ND YAG laser to induce focal tissue coagulation in an experimental brain model, which led to the development of lit. After several clinical trials, in 1990, Sugiyama reported the clinical application of lit to treat five patients with brain tumors. Ablation procedure was performed under CT guidance. But lit really didn't change until MRI was introduced. So the initial use of MRI to monitor and control thermal ablation was reported by Jolitz. He used MRI for preoperative targeting of the lesion and for postoperative demonstration of reversible and irreversible thermal changes of the ND YAG laser on tissues. However, MRI could not be used to predict the tissue's actual temperature change during the ablation procedure. Recent advances in MRI equipment, thermal imaging sequences, software, and laser delivery techniques and equipment enabled the prediction and accurate control of tissue temperatures, which renewed the use of the ND YAG laser. This reintroduced laser reintroduced the laser as a promising minimally invasive alternative for management of several intracranial pathologies, mainly tumors. And so right now there are two main types of lit systems. First, we have the Neuroblade, which got its FDA clearance in 2009, and brain mass is, is its uh, main use. Uh, and it uses a 1064 nanometer diode pulse laser with a CO2 cooled side firing probe or diffusing tip probe. And these probes are important and I'll get to that. Visualase, which got its FDA clearance in 2007, 
is, is mostly used for epilepsy and uses a 15 watt, 980 nanometer dial laser that is saline cooled. Patients who use Neuroblade tend to be much older than those who use visual laser. That's just a trend. And differing wavelengths, along with other properties of each system, will result in differences in tissue penetration and destruction. So now a general overlook of a lit system. So lit system comprises, comprises of a laser system, a workstation, and an MRI. As mentioned before, there are only two clinically uh, FDA-approved lit systems, the visual aid system and the neuroblade system. And the main differences, as mentioned before, are the laser wavelength and the pulling method, and also heat production and distribution pattern are also and so, but now a general overlook. So just talk about the general laser system, general workstation system. So the laser system comprises of a laser light source, laser fibers, applicators, sheath, and diffusion tip. The laser is generated by uh, the source and then transmitted from the source through the tumor through optical fibers. During transmission of the laser, part of the energy can be lost and is absorbed by the transmitting fibers and eventually damage the fibers. Laser fibers can be optical or sapphire, with sapphire being preferred. Sapphire fibers are better as they can resist heat and transmit layer lasers with minimal energy absorption, and this makes them more durable and more efficient. Sapphire fibers are being adopted more and more for lit systems instead of the traditional transmitting fibers, transmitting optical fiber. And so laser fibers are flexible and are carried to the center of the tumor by an applicator system, the visual aids, or by a self-contained system, such as in the neuroblade system. Different types of applicators exist, however. A cool tip is the most useful for lit. Cooling allows the ablation to continue for longer and at higher temperatures without damaging the diffusing tip or charring the tumor tissue on contact. Charring decreases the absorption of laser energy and interferes with transmission of heat. An optical diffusing tip modifies the laser beam to a spherical emission, hence achieving a homogeneous and symmetric distribution of energy into the sphere of heat. The laser can interact with the tissue Chew in four main ways. With the main, with the first one being the photothermal effect. Light is converted into heat in the tissue, and it is this effect that is the basis for lit. The second effect, or the second way that the laser interacts with the tissue, is through the photochemical effect. And through this, there's a reaction between the laser light and tissue containing a photosensitizing photosens agent. The latter is activated by light and leading to phototoxic reaction in the tissue. Photomechanical effect is a third form of how laser interacts with tissue and it involves high intensity, short laser pulses that can create local shock waves and mechanical stress. The fourth effect is the photoablative effect where cell molecular bonds are broken, which is increased in the tissues and it's also called photorefractive interaction. Moving on to the workstation. An MRI images obtained before and during the lit procedure are sent from the MRI scanner to a linked workstation. The workstation provides real-time thermal maps for monitoring the procedure and estimates tissue necrosis. With the visual aid system, one can also assign temperature limits as safety points to trigger system deactivation, preventing undesired thermal damage nearby by the organ. Um, structures. The neural blade system has a thermal couple at the tip of the probe that determines the baseline temperature, baseline brain temperature, and then regulates the amount of CO2 circulate through the tip of the probe to maintain a predetermined temperature range. The laser shuts off automatically if the valid temperature range of the tip. And finally, the MRI. The MRI is essential to the safety of this procedure. Successful, 
successful thermal ablation requires the accurate targeting of the tumor and maintenance of a sufficient temperature level while excluding damage to the structures. MRI is used to identify the lesion and plan the trajectory for the laser probe. More importantly, it is used to visualize and quantify heat deposition within and surrounding the area of ablation. This is a process called magnetic resonance thermometry. MR thermometry provides a non-invasive real-time temperature monitoring during the procedure and assesses target cell death. This real-time temperature monitoring is done through the use of mathematical models that calculates the damage. This is where I was referring to the Arrhenius rate analysis model before. And so the Arrhenius rate analysis model damages the model's damage as a change in the state of the tissue with the recognition that coagulation occurs between 54 and 60 degrees Celsius, with denaturation of proteins and cellular components and cell death. The second type of model that can be used is a CM43 model, which is based on the Arrhenius model. And it uses empirical data from hyperthermia observations. In the CEM43 model, cell damage is quantified by relating the temporal temperature history to a reference constant temperature of 43 degrees Celsius. CEM43 is the cumulative equivalent, minutes equivalent to the time at the reference temperature of 43 degrees Celsius. Third, the threshold temperature model assumes that tissue is irreparably damaged instantaneously once it reaches 60 degrees Celsius. This third model does not take into account the temperature history and is you really only adapted to rapid tissue ablation rather than lit procedures. This third model can significantly underestimate the tissue damage if the thermal gradient is inlit. Moving on to the clinical workflow. So the first step of lit is a pre-procedural stereostactic MRI. Post gain ged gadolinium axial spoiled gradient volumetric sequence is acquired and used for registration to ensure adequate delineation of the tumor. This imaging can be obtained via drop through MRI uh, immediately before the lip. The patient is put in a lateral, supine, or prone position, depending on the tumor location. General anesthesia is administered in the operator. Navigation software is used for registration and trajectory planning. And the operator determines the appropriate entry point, the target, and the tra trajectory angle. The best trajectory should avoid, when possible, passing through scar tissue, the operative bed, the ventricles, vessels at the entry point, and, and angulation at the entry point should not exceed 30 degrees. So there's a lot the operator has to do. A burr hole is made then at the entry site and a stereotactic bolt is placed in the calivarium for one trajectory or two bolts are placed for two trajectories. The uh, brain tumor is large. The patient is then positioned within, our intra, within the intraoperative MRI, and a robotic probe driver is attached to the stereotactic bolt or bolt. The laser probe or probes are then advanced to the hole until they reach the center of the lesion. Before starting the ablation, pretreatment images are obtained, and they are obtained in the form of 3D T1 weighted fast spoiled gradient images form of MRI scan. With a small field of view, and are required to show the full length of the probe and to ensure accurate positioning in the lesion. A T1 or T2 flare image is then acquired to act as an anatomical reference image as a background on the workstation to overlay the real time images. And I'll talk more and we'll look at some examples of these T1 weighted images and these some flare images as well. Here on. Now to the clinical workflow continued. And so thermal imaging uses a fast spoiled gradient to recall echo sequence, which takes about eight seconds and is run repeatedly during the ablation procedure. When ablation starts, the acquired images are compared with the reference images at the workstation and generate color-coded thermal maps using the previously mentioned Arrhenius model or the CEM43 model. Based on ablation time and temperature, the workstation generates an irreversible damage estimate map, which is color-coded and overlays the reference image. The laser is stopped when the estimated irreversible damage extends to include the entire desired ablation area. 
post-lit subtraction scan and dynamic contrast enhanced DCE perfusion scan can be obtained to evaluate the extent of ablation and whether there is any residual untreated tumor. And so first we would have some scans and here we go. So here we have a couple of T1 weighted MRI scans involving uh, the lit procedure for a glioblastoma. And picture A shows a scan done before lit where a ring enhancing mass right here where the long arrow is, I don't know if you can see that, is visible near the center of the brain. B e scan, this one right here, presents the laser probe within the mass. You can see the laser probe right out of the head. And this is presented by the arrowhead. The scan was taken intraoperatively, obviously. And the C MRI scan was taken two and a half months after the lift procedure, and the tumor shows a mild decrease in size of its mass. It's presented by the short arrow. Finally, for the D MRI scan, which was taken four months after lit, demonstrates the complete resolution of the glioblastoma. So as you can see, this is four months after the lit procedure, and there is almost nothing. And so for this next round of scans, second, sorry. we again have some T1 weighted MRI scans, except for some uh, flare images, uh, which are images B and F. And flare images are used to suppress uh, fluids. Um, so moving on, image A was taken before a lip procedure and presents a metastasis in the right medial temporal lobe, right here where the arrow is and image B is a flare image taken before the lip procedure and demonstrates surrounding vasogenic edema. And this is presented using these white arrowheads. At C, we see that the image shows the ablation probe tip within the metastatic lesion. This is that patch arrow. It's a rather tiny black dot. It's harder to see from this angle. But... Uh, the D image was taken four months. So this one, the first one on the bottom row. Four months after lit, and it shows a slightly decreased enhancement at the treated lesion. And so you can see compared to uh, image A, it has decreased uh, one. Then finally, at e, uh, e and F, uh, image E is a uh, T1 weighted image, and the image F is a flare image, and they were both taken 10 months after lit. And they both show a complete resolution of the uh, tumor and the vasogenic edema. And so with lit being a rather uh, new uh, procedure, uh, it's been in the pipeline for a while, but in terms of its uh, clinical use, it's rather new. Um, there haven't been too many uh, studies uh, using it or examining the use of it, um, but there have been a couple. And as you can see here, we don't have quite as many patients, the most being 35 in the Mohammadi uh, study. And they test for different tumor types. But what's the uh, real, uh, I don't want to like show stopper is the major complications percentage. Very low, like zero low, except for when there were more patients that did have an increased major complications rate of um, 6%. But compare that to uh, studies examining the use of craniotomy with high-grade gliomas. Um, these have obviously, since surgery is more common and more uh, popular than uh, lit right now, um, they have more patients for the studies but their major complication rates are much higher. So this uh, presents LIT as a very promising and uh, safe way to uh, deal with. So just to conclude one more time, while studies have been very selective and limited, LIT has shown to have the potential to be a safer with fewer post-op complications and a more invasive technique like surgery. And more effective solution for some patients who are not surgery candidates or have tried other solutions that have not worked. Some complications, however, can include vascular injury and seizures. 
And so, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andre Mocano. Uh, may I ask you some questions? Of course. Uh, the first one would be, what um, what is the next gen like next step in lit in terms of technological improvement? So that's a that's a very good question. Um, well, just like any medical procedure or technique, the goal is accuracy and uh, precision. Uh, lit is still very young and. It's very much in its infancy. And while it's already accurate and precise, there's always room for improvement. Um, so a space where there is a lot of potential is in artificial intelligence or AI. And uh, AI through machine learning uh, could be used pre-op to help assist the surgical team, uh, the operator of the workstation to help find the best point of entry for the laser probe and also the best angle. Also improvements in laser technology will help the procedure be more precise. Um, also for cooling methods to help control, uh, be, help control how much uh, irreversible tissue damage you're creating. So to be able to control the heat and cooling would be better. So that's where I see the next technological improvements. Okay, now, um, you know how they say in society that uh, cell phones code, like may cause cancer. In your opinion, what is the risk of a cell phone exposure as a potential cause of a brain tumor? Um, well, this is interesting because there really isn't a set answer. Um, studies have been mixed when it comes to cell phones and if they play a role in brain tumor development. Uh, some studies, uh, uh, published so far have not established a clear link between cell phone use and development of tumor, but these studies have had some important limitations um, because uh, either they did not track their uh, uh, the people involved in studies for too, for too long of a period, and also cell phone usage in, has continued to skyrocket, so it's been impossible to maintain a standard of what cell phone usage means. So a uh, study from five years ago is completely outdated compared to right now when it comes to cell phones. And so I hate to give you a we don't know answer, but right now it's just we don't know. Um, okay, thanks. Um, is lit used in, in with other treatments? Um, yeah, lit is used with other treatments, uh, mainly chemotherapy and sometimes uh, radiation therapy. And uh, patients might also get an immune drug that might boost the immune system after lit. Uh, and this is in order to go after the dead tumor tissue that might be left over from the procedure. And uh, this is done because the dead tumor tissue might activate and stimulate any recurrent. I found a part in your presentation really interesting and it got me to this question. Does lit work in all parts of the brain? So that's, uh, that's a question a lot of people have when it comes to lit because they think, how far can you inject the laser into my head? And so, but lit can work in all parts of the brain because the laser can be inserted in almost any part. Uh, however, it does work differently in different parts, especially near large blood vessels or ventricles. Uh, and that's mostly because these, uh, the ventricles and blood vessels, they act as heat sinks, so they absorb a lot of the heat. And so it's harder to calculate uh, calculate heat damage to a tumor. You don't know how much is getting absorbed by the heat sink that is the uh, blood vessel or ventricle. And so um, this can make ablation of the tumor somewhat tricky. And that's also where I can see AI being used, but that's, uh, but yeah, just to answer your question, lit does work in all parts. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. Thank you. this excellent presentation. I hope to have you with you in future events. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andre Mocano. Thank you again. One moment.